Welcome to the Cisco London 2012 Plan for Success webinar series from Cisco, which aims to help UK businesses prepare for the Games. I'm Ian Foddering and I'm the CTO for Cisco in the UK and Ireland, and I have the exciting responsibility of leading the technical strategy within Cisco for our involvement as the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games Network Infrastructure Supporter. For this webinar, Cisco has teamed up with fellow London 2012 partners, the BBC, BT and ADECO, to examine the way people will consume the Olympic Games digitally and socially, together with the impact that this will have on businesses throughout the London 2012 Games period. We will cover the issues for business and IT managers around what needs to be considered for companies around the Games to help reduce absenteeism, manage productivity and encourage team spirit and how this might impact the network capacity. With me today I am pleased to welcome Tim Plimming from the BBC here in the studio, together with Tim Bowden from BT and Stephen Kirkpatrick from ADECO, who will be joining us later via Cisco Telepresence from London City. The BBC is the Olympic broadcaster and holds the exclusive rights across all platforms to show the Summer and win Winter Olympics and has shown live coverage for every Summer Olympics since 1960. This long-standing association between the Olympic Games and the BBC will now include coverage of the 2012 Summer Olympic and Paralympics and will be held here in London. The BBC also manages the network of big screens in city centres around the country where people will congregate to enjoy the Games coverage together. BT are the official communication services partner for London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, chosen for their expertise in delivering large, reliable communication networks and services. Of course, they are also a very key internet service provider for both business and consumers around the UK. ADECO UK are the official London 2012 Olympics and Paralympics recruitment services provider. They are the global leader in human resource services and will play a vital role in the preparations. Put simply, in Seb Coe's words, the quality of the people we hire will have direct impact on the success of the 2012 Games. So what to expect from the session today? We hope you will find the next 30 to 45 minutes useful in terms of identifying any ideas you might like to implement or any changes needed to reflect Games viewing and enjoyment. If you have any questions at any point, please post them in the comments box and we'll try our best to include as many of them as possible in this session. So at this point, I'd like to go to the first question, which Tim, I'd like to, to pose to you uh, from a BBC perspective. Mm -hmm. How are the BBC delivering the Olympics this year? So Ian, the BBC's always seen London 2012 as an opportunity to deliver what we're talking in the organisation as the first ever digital Olympics. Um, this year we'll see the switch off of our analogue television services and so we'll be in a totally digital environment. And the BBC has made a commitment to deliver every single minute of Olympic action to audiences across all of our digital platforms. So from television, online, smartphone, tablet and the new generation of connected TV devices as well. And that means uh, every single minute of uh, Olympic action from all of the venues across the UK. Uh, and it means particularly for minority sport audiences that we can give them a sort of service level that we've never been able to give them before. There have been some sports fans who have had very little coverage as the games have gone on of particular sports. And it means that we can serve them with all of the content that they want to see. And we're putting that across all of our digital platforms. We think actually on that peak Saturday, that middle weekend Saturday, that could be up to 24 events that we'll be covering, allowing people to see, really have the best ticket in town uh, as they go across all of the different venues. So 24 um, channels that we'll essentially be running and all of those in, uh, in high definition. So what's your overall strategy for streaming all of this content and the increased number of uh, views? 
So we've been uh, working with uh, a number of um, uh, our partner distributors to, to ensure that they know, A, what the BBC is going to be putting out over our, our networks. Um, it means that uh, we've, uh, for a, a year or so, had uh, a number of distribution partners into the BBC. We've been telling them about our plans, helping them prepare for this amount of content that we're going to be putting out across our network. I mean, it's interesting that this will be, will be reliant on IP and digital services for a way that we've never had to before. You know, this commitment to deliver up to 24 live events at, at any one time means that the, the next generation of digital broadcast services are really coming of age. They become, really, as we term in the BBC, to be broadcast critical. So we've been working with partners for over a year to make sure that the experience for all of our users is as good as it can be. Fantastic. And, you know, we've talked a lot about live content, but what are your plans, or BBC's plans, around providing on-demand content? Yes, yeah, so Ian, as I say, we'll be uh, allowing people to watch up to 24 live events at any one, at any one time. But we'll also be making all of that uh, content available for audiences to um, uh, catch up on. Uh, many of our audiences will know our really popular iPlayer service and audiences are now in the, in the experience of being able to catch up on all of that content and we will be turning around that content really rapidly allowing audiences to, to navigate their way around stuff whether it's just happened or whether it was a GB gold medal win a few days ago uh, and to be able to point their friends uh, to that and I know we'll pick up that, this later in the session today. Fantastic and that, that's going to be available both in standard and high definition? That's right so standard and high definition it will really depend depends on the kind of connection speed that um, our audiences are connected to. But we'll be making it all available in, uh, in standard definition and in high quality, high definition. Excellent, thank you. So at this point, I'd like to bring in Tim Bowden, who should be available. There we are. Hello, Tim. Hello, um, Larry. Tim from uh, BT. I mean, how are BT helping the BBC, uh, along with other broadcasters, to stream all of this content? Well, there's, there's really two sides to, uh, to this particular challenge. I mean, firstly, there's the supply side, where we are uh, sort of working with Olympic Broadcast Services to basically make sure that their traffic gets, uh, gets from the different venues back to the International Broadcast Centre. Um, within London, that means point-to-point -point broadcast access fibre services uh, from uh, the venues back to the IBC. Uh, they're basically fully resilient, no single points of failure. And then within the actual uh, rest of uh, the country, that's the football venues and the sailing, we're actually providing BT's media and broadcast uh, network that's currently used for the digital platforms for the BBC and ITV. And that, again, provides a fully resilient network to uh, get back uh, to, the, to the International Broadcast Centre. Once the broadcasters then take the content over from OBS and they can then transmit it out from the broadcast centre to the rest of the world. I think the other side of the challenge is the demand side. Um, really there, what we've tried to do is we've looked at previous major sporting events and how the internet broadband platforms have been affected by them. Um, probably the best examples we could show there are firstly the World Cup in 2010, where quite a lot of the games were actually happening during working hours. And we saw about a 20% increase in business broadband traffic while the england Slovenia game was going on. Um, and similarly, we've seen a similar size of peak for both the Japan earthquake and also the Royal Wedding on the retail side. So we think we've got a rough idea of the likely spike in demand. We've then built that into sort of other factors such as the fact that certain events will have more popular demand than others because British athletes will be involved. Uh, obviously the range of connected devices that you've now got and also the changes in demographics with an increase in the number of home workers. And we've used that to predict what we think will be the traffic impact on the, on the network. Um, so then in terms of then moving that forward, in our core we've increased our capacity to peer with other internet providers and we've also looked at the way in which um, the BBC uses content delivery networks to support its traffic and we've made sure we've got sufficient capacity to those CDNs. And then at the retail side, um, we've brought forward our investments from 2013 to 2012 in next generation broadband traffic, which will give us sufficient capacity to support the demand. So overall, we're quite confident that we can uh, deliver the increase in demand that we're expecting. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. And I know from a, a Cisco point of view, we're working very closely with BT in terms of delivering some of those uh, services that you talked about there. So thank you. 
Um, so I've got a question for, for everyone here, and, and Stephen, maybe we can start with you, if that's OK. I mean, what, um, what are you anticipating, or are you anticipating any problems uh, for organisations with London 2012 coming? I think it's different for different parts of the UK. I think for those organisations outside of central London, I think it will be very similar to another special event, a World Cup we've talked about today, or a royal wedding. So it's more managing the workload. However, if you were to believe some of the forecasts in and around travel to work issues inside central London, I really do think it will have a major impact on the businesses that are set up inside uh, the square mile. Thank you, Stephen. Um, maybe, Tim, from BBC perspective, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so Ian, I think for, from a point of getting our content to our audiences, as Stephen said, uh, we're not expecting um, any particularly uh, big problems. We've been planning, working with our distribution partners to ensure that the content we're going to be putting over the, over the network, over UK internet, um, is, uh, is going to be within the, the, the the uh, bounds of what we'll be able to get sure. get get over, um, and we uh, uh, we think we've probably um, you know reached already probably with the World Cup and the Royal Wedding we've probably reached that sort of peak moment of concurrent users. Um, we're able to deal with that and deal with that very well, um, and we see we see traffic in that kind of region for London 2012. So we're very confident that the, the content will be able to get get to our users. Okay, thank you, uh, and Tim from a BT perspective. I mean, I think, I think from a networking capacity perspective, um, we're not really foreseeing any, any great problems provided organisations actually look at what their potential demand is and plan for it. I mean, certainly in BT, we've, done a, we've had a major programme which we call Business at Unusual, which has really been focusing on how BT is going to continue to operate as an organisation whilst the games. And we've looked at things like suppliers, supply chains, deliveries, building access, transport, and we've got a fundamental plan there to make sure that our business actually continues as usual. So as long as organisations have planned and looked at those sorts of things, then I'm confident they'll continue to function quite, quite well. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. So I think what's really interesting is if you look back over the last four years, we've seen some really big shifts in the way in which technology uh, is now being used. And therefore, how the London 2012 uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games can be consumed. And I think... Uh, probably one of the highlights around that is around the use of social media. So whether it's Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn or, or other platforms, I think it really has the opportunity to shape the way in which these communities of people, friends, organisations can come together around London 2012. So, Tim, from a, from a BBC perspective, how do you see social media having an impact this year? So I think on a, on a number of levels, give you an example of one thing that we think social media is going to be used for. Um, putting out every minute of Olympic action sounds like a great thing, but it creates an unimaginable amount of choice. 24 events um, happening across all of the different venues in the, in the UK, all of those different athletes, all of those different uh, sports, all of those different countries. It creates an unimaginable amount of content. And we're, we're, we're particularly now starting to see social media being used for, by audiences as a way of navigating that content, of friends being able to say, here's some great content that we've seen, particularly for sports associations, being able to guide their members to particular things happening. So over that games period, over all of those different concurrent events, social media is a way of being able to navigate, audiences using it as a way of navigating this amazing content store, really, of information. Information. And particularly one of the other things that we're seeing audiences do is, is add value to their experience by, by the use of social media. So this is the kind of Twitter activity that we'll see on some of our, our broadcasts at the moment. It really adds value to that experience. So we might see it as a second screen um, experience. Someone sat on the sofa with a tablet device um, being able to see what's happening across uh, 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 Twitter as, as, as they're watching the live programme. We know that's particularly useful for some of of our presenter teams and of course this will be the first Olympic Games that's a connected TV uh, 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 Olympic Games as well. So some of that functionality of uh, social media being pulled into broadcast available for the first time in a connected TV uh, environment as well. And I think that would be quite uh, something that I think a lot of broadcasters are looking to see at London 2012 for the first time and ahead of Rio see uh, how social media on connected TV is going to have an effect and, and change this world so fast. Thank you, Tim. And Tim, if I could come to you, I mean, for, again, from a BT point of view, I mean, how easy will it be for media to share their experiences at the events? 
So I think the, the first thing to realise, Ian, is that Spectrum is actually at a, quite a premium in the Olympic in the venues. Um, not only are there business critical applications uh, such as cameras, wireless cameras and ceremony management, there's also sports uh, field of play applications that use wireless. So the first thing you've got to try and do is to limit the amount of wireless traffic and then use wired wherever possible. So we flood wired all the media areas of venues with wired ports that actually allow media access to 8 meg DSL type like services to access the Internet. Um, where this is impractical, we're supporting the mobile networks by the use of data offload technologies that again allow the media to use uh, wireless technologies from their mobile phones. And then in areas like press conference rooms, we're actually putting in wireless services uh, because obviously wired is, is not practical in those areas. Um, and with the size of some of these conference rooms, we're having to invest in not only what you might call traditional wireless technologies, but also looking at high density wireless techniques, working with Cisco to look at uh, focused antennas to actually increase the capacity of areas and how we actually optimize the wireless protocols to get the highest capacities for the media to get to get good use. So overall, it's a strategy that's basically about trying to provide them firstly with wired access, secondly with mobile and wireless access, and then making sure that they've got access to the services that they need where they need them. Okay, thank you, Tim. If I could stay with you, if we come out of the, the Olympic venues themselves and look at how all of that uh, streaming of the, the content will be consumed, as we talked about earlier on. How do we ensure, or how do organisations ensure that their infrastructure, their network infrastructure is capable of supporting all of that data that will be going over it? I think the, the first step is definitely to understand exactly what type of connectivity organisations have and how much capacity they, they have. I mean, probably the first thing I should emphasise is anybody who's got a private circuit with guaranteed bandwidth, that won't be affected by the, uh, by the games itself. And certainly also organisations who have got prioritised virtual private networks, uh, those will still continue to operate as well. So the particular areas that organisations need to focus on are obviously their home worker capacity. Do they actually have enough sufficient for the people who are going to be working at home? And especially if their home workers actually access the internet via their corporate VPNs, uh, then it could actually doubly increase the amount of traffic going through. And then finally, obviously, look at their internet connectivity and actually the sizes of the pipes. So if they see that they have a challenge there, then really there's four things that are open to them. I mean, firstly, and the most simplest thing is basically to have a clear policy on internet usage. I mean, that needs to be based on a clear structured communications plan to employees. It needs to have a clear rationale. And it also actually needs to have clear sanctions to, to make sure that people understand the potential impact or that internet access can have on the business if it's misused. Beyond that, they can look at uh, provision of broadcast TVs in common areas um, and also TVs and TV, TV replay facilities. Um, they can also look at uh, the actual capacity. It may be that they're planning network upgrades already and actually the Olympics provides a trigger for those upgrades to happen. And certainly that was one of the things we found from our research into the Vancouver Games, that a lot of organisations brought forward those investments and uh, used it as a way of de-risking their, their own internal operations. I guess the final ultimate sanction is to, is to block or limit traffic. Um, that's obviously a, a, bit, a bit draconian, You'd rather, because you may find there are a number of applications that stop working if you start blocking access to multimedia or flash. So it's not something necessarily we'd recommend. Um, certainly, if you've got uh, some of the more advanced Cisco infrastructures, there are options to, to look at configuring them to actually rate limit particular services as well. Um, but that's quite complex to set up and manage, so it would only really be done by organisations that have that sort of depth of control in their own, uh, their own sort of IT infrastructure. But those are basically the steps, sort of do a capacity management, ideally police it, provide other, other facilities, look to increase the capacity or finally as a last step to, uh, to block and manage. Thank you, Tim. And I mean, just on that point around the Cisco infrastructure, I mean, certainly when I talk to, to customers about this, I mean, they do have the capability typically within their own Cisco infrastructure to start to implement some form of quality of service rate limiting. 
and differentiating between the different streams of traffic that are residing over their network so that they can prioritise it based on their requirements. Uh, and so they can start to facilitate and balance between the need to provide some of this live streaming that we've talked about and obviously the business critical applications that are, are, are fundamentally required for that organisation. So um, a, a question, if I can, Stephen, to yourself. Um, you know, obviously businesses need to ensure that they continue to be productive during uh, London 2012. Um, you know, what, what can they do to, to make sure that happens? Well, again, I think it's different for different businesses in different geographies. There's absolutely a workload to manage, but I think the key is planning. If we were to think about businesses operating in central London where there could be bigger problems, um, we're, we're one. We have a branch infrastructure and we have got a number of business units inside central London. What we have done is we've mapped where all of our uh, staff are that travel into central London. Where do they travel from? We've taken a look at, is there a branch network that supports them where they live? If so, do we have a couple of spare workstations that map where everybody lives? So that in a situation where it is difficult to get into central London, do we have an alternative to home working? Because the other side of the market that we're in is that there's only so much that you can do uh, from home in our line of work. So for us, the priority is finding alternative locations. And if we don't do that, then we could run into a lot of um, difficulties. I, I think that outside of that, if you were living more and working more broadly across the UK, it's, it's purely workload management. And I think one of the benefits of the Olympics versus a World Cup is the, the events can be a lot shorter. So if you imagine the difference between a 90 minute football match and, you know, 10 seconds or nine and a half seconds, if you're Usain Bolt in the uh, uh, 100 meter uh, sprint, you know, people will be leaving their workstations potentially for a shorter period of time. So I think you have to trust your people to get through the workload. But I do think the nature of the games uh, is set as such that they're going to be away from their workstations for a minimal amount of time. Fantastic. Thank you, Stephen. If I could stay with you for a second. I mean, a lot of people talk about some of the challenges that are present as a result of London 2012. But equally, there's some fantastic opportunities uh, that London 2012 represents to a lot of organi organisations. So how can organisations actually embrace it and use it as an opportunity to bring their staff together? Well, it's a fantastic opportunity to engage your teams and have fun. And I think that, that la life is about having fun whilst doing your job. You know, if you take a look at it from its most basic components, there's the opportunity to have competitions and sweeps. How many gold medals will Team GP win? What will be the time of the person that wins the 100 metre sprint? All of these things can bring uh, competition and fun to the workplace. It, and it's not just about the exchange of, of cash in that event. It could be that the, you know, the biggest loser has to make tea for the week. It could be anything like that there that gets people talking. I think... If you take a look at some of the uh, uh, workplaces where there's um, a bigger population of people, from our research, both internally and externally, the amount of information flow today through online means that people can be sitting two, three, four, five desks away from each other and never actually speak. And it sounds incredible, but it's the, it's the truth. And this is an opportunity if you're using uh, you know, a common TV broadcasting uh, device in a common area to get everybody together, to watch the main events, to watch Team GB going for gold, so that, you know, in the morning, the next afternoon, the next week, the next month, there is a, a commonality and a humanity around a conversation in a lift, a conversation around the water cooler. And I think that that's incredibly important. Again, if you were to look at um, a factory environment, a number of factory environments that I've certainly visited across the years, although there may be many people working there, everybody has their own isolated workstation. It's the nature of that work. And again, through common areas, there is the opportunity to bring people together and make it more than coming into work, doing your job and leaving work. And I think that's a fantastic opportunity not to be missed. And the Olympics provide that for us all. Thank you, Stephen. So, Tim, if I could come back to you in the studio, I mean, not every organisation will have the opportunity to provide TV connectivity or even potentially uh, streaming over their network to, to their employees. So what can organisations do to uh, enable some of these events? 
Yeah, so we, we, we've had a number of um, organisations contact us wondering whether they can show the BBC um, coverage. And we've put some guidelines actually on the, on the BBC 2012 website for organisations, uh, bbc.co.uk forward slash 2012. There are some, some guidelines. But essentially the, the, the top story we say to people is that the BBC is a free-to-air public service broadcaster. People can show those games with some, some guidelines. They obviously have to have a TV licence mm -hmm. and they can't put their own adverts in and they can't sell advertising around the screen. But but broadly, if they're if they're sensible and they work within those guidelines, and people can show the BBC, and that's a great it's a great story really, because part of the job of the BBC is to bring the UK together behind big events, um, and the events don't get much bigger than the um, than the Olympic Games. So we're working with um, with organisations. Um, you know, we know they're planning to put TVs in reception areas, in canteen areas, uh, as a way of, uh, as Stephen said, bringing the organisation together, making it feel like something to be able to look back on and remember. Um, the uh, you know this summer as an extraordinary moment in their working life. We know some organisations are even planning to rearrange their lunch hours around particular Team GB medal win moments. So lunch may actually be 2:30 one afternoon, or it may be 11:31 morning um, to 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 match either something that Rebecca Adlington or Tom Daly or one of the other great um, athletes is going to be is going to be doing. And the great thing is, I say, within the guidelines that we have online, people can show that content um, from the, from the BBC on any of our of any of our platforms um, and as they can connect to it and they can show it fantastic well thank you so at this point we're, we're going to move to to the technology that we're talking about in some uh, instances here mm. and actually look at some of the questions that we've had come in from the audience um, so uh, just uh, as a reminder if, if there are any questions that you've had you've got based on some of the the answers and the points that have been made today then please do submit them and we'll do our best to go through them uh, today. So um, actually, Tim, maybe I can stick with you yeah. actually, because uh, one of the questions that's come in here from uh, Amar is um, how many people are expected to be watching London 2012 online? Well, in it's something we're going to be able to give you a definite answer for after the games, but we can give you um, a, a prediction of what we think is going to be the, the, the peak level of traffic. What, what we're planning for is probably a, up to a million concurrent users. That would be uh, just a little bit ahead of what we've had as our previous high watermark um, for the World Cup or the other events that Tim from BT was talking about. So as we take those kind of peak concurrent users, and this is the number of people at any one time who are connected to the same line, stream. We uh, have taken that number, added it just a little and we think that that's something like a, a million comfortably with, within what UK internet is going to be able to deal with but something like up to a million concurrent users watching a, a, a key GB medal win at any one time. Okay, brilliant. Well, I look forward to, uh, to watching it in that way. So a, a question to everyone um, that's come in from Spencer. If businesses are struggling to cope with demand during the games, will there be resources available to help solve the problems? I don't know, maybe if we start with Stephen, with yourself. Well, I, I hope they have a good recruitment agency. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's about planning and I think it's a really good point because that's what, where the fear is. But ultimately, if people are uh, struggling to cope with demand, it usually is uh, people driven and headcount driven. So as long as the people that are managing the workflows have a plan B and they have briefed their agency or they've briefed their backup if they have their own pool of temporary and transient workers, there should be no problem. It's the organisations that perhaps don't think that there could be up to, I think it's 25 to 27 percent in previous games um, in relation to absenteeism. If people do not have a plan B, then you could be in a situation where somebody is standing there with a, 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 an amount of demand in front of them that they just can't work with. Thank you, Simon. And Tim, from a BT perspective, do you have any thoughts? Um, I, th I think a lot of it depends upon the actual uh, services that they've bought. A lot of BT services have the ability to be flexed up and down. And so if they've got those types of services that allow them to change the amount of capacity that they need for, say, a period of a month over the games and then flex it down after the games, then that obviously gives them the easiest sort of opportunity to actually respond to, uh, to changes in demand. It's, it's a little more challenging if you've bought services that are uh, fairly fixed in terms of their capacity. I think then it comes down to some of the points I made earlier about actually uh, having planned beforehand and considering the options and trying to work through the different ways in which you can actually uh, 
constrain or control the bandwidth that your network uh, is using. I mean, I think it's everything to do with the Olympics is about planning and, and thinking about it beforehand because that gives you the maximum opportunity to respond. Great. Thank you, Tim. And Tim, any thoughts from you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the points that Tim and Stephen have made about planning is is the key thing. Okay. This will take the nation by storm. Anyone who's seen uh, an Olympic city during the Olympic period will see that it just seizes the whole city, the whole nation. Um, and planning for it, uh, planning for this extraordinary summer, is going to be is going to be the key the key thing. It's going to hit everyone. The thing that will separate organisations is, I guess, those that have thought about it and planned, and those those that have Agreed. Absolutely. So um, if I could come back to you, Tim, um, there's a question come in here to BT from uh, a gentleman by the name of Tom. Um, how are you going to ensure, maybe not you personally, but how are, how are you going to ensure that video streams from Olympic venues are working effectively? I mean, I think it's, to some extent, I kind of touched a little bit on this earlier. I mean, it's about the partnership that we have with Olympic Broadcast Services. Um, so we are providing the underlying capacity and fibre infrastructure that allows them to get their, uh, their video content back from the venues to the International Broadcast Centre. Uh, it's a partnership between us. Um, so we provide the underlying infrastructure. They are actually m managing the services and that's their role as an organisation is every Olympics, they are responsible for actually the delivery and the quality of the, of the video streams. Our role is essentially to make sure they have an infrastructure that, that, that can't go wrong and is resilient, diversity rooted and all the things that you would expect from a company like BT. So fundamentally it's a partnership between ourselves and, and OBS that will achieve that. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess uh, maybe a question to, to yourself, uh, Stephen, from a DECO point of view. I mean, what are you seeing being the general trend in terms of enabling people to watch the games and be part of the games within the workplace? I mean, what, what's the general trend you're seeing at the moment? Um, I think from the customers that we speak to, um, I think everybody's talking about it um, and what are they going to do and how are they going to do it. Um, my, my fear is that it's not too far away now. What is it, 150 days before the games start? I, I think that a number of organisations need to be doing a little bit more than talking about it at this stage because that, that time's going to go past very, very quickly. Um, but, you know, as we've heard today, um, there's been a lot of planning done in other organisations who've been working on it for the last year to make sure that they can deliver a games experience as well as a customer and client experience to the people that they work with day and daily, that it doesn't get in the way. But, you know, my, my advice would be, you know, talk and talk and talk and doesn't really get you anywhere. There's got to be a point in time where you make a decision around how you're going to give the experience to the people that you work with. And maybe if I could stay with you and put you on the spot slightly here. Um, do, do, you, <laughs> do, you, do you feel that businesses have potentially underestimated the, the, the value and, and the challenges that may exist around London 2012? Yes, I do. Fundamentally, I do. You know, I, I, I think that um, the issues are there. You can find them on the internet from previous experience from game cities. Um, there, there is no reason for you to get caught out. But I do think that we live in a very fast-paced society and business world. There is always something more pressing today than something that you've got to think about tomorrow. And I think that is the hole that some organisations will fall down. And I, 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 and I think, you know, from our own perspective, when we speak to our client base, we're constantly talking about what's going to happen in August. Um, from our own benefit and our own perspective, not just theirs, because to deliver uh, quality to your customers and your clients and, all, and to deliver an experience to your, to your people, you need to be engaging with all of your suppliers and partners to make sure that you've got an end-to-end -end solution. And I think that that there is something that needs to be talked about a bit more, which is why I'm here today, because I think it's a, 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 an incredibly important subject. Yeah, and I think if I, if I can add to that, um, I mean, BT has done quite a lot of research looking at how the games impacted Vancouver. Um, and there were a whole lot of different issues that were raised by organisations in for the Winter Olympics. A lot of them saw increased levels of absenteeism, uh, certainly more than they thought they would see, which kind of suggests that, yes, you do need to prepare for, the, for that. And also a lot of uh, organisations felt they could have made more of the games. They actually felt that they had underestimated the potential for value as well and that therefore they should uh, could work more effectively in terms of bringing that together. So I think there's a very strong message from the Vancouver research that... Uh, 
that, that organisations really do need to plan and think about this. Thank you. And maybe the final question to yourself, Tim. I mean, what are the BBC doing in preparation for the Games? I mean, I'm assuming that you're going to be moving yourself to the Olympic uh, Park at some point. Yes, yeah, so that's right. We, um, I mean, our core, um, our core uh, Olympic sport, sport Olympic team will go out into the International Broadcast Centre and we will set up our operation there with NBC and all of the other world broadcasters. So we'll move out shortly before, before the Games to do that. Uh, we're also, of course, working out how we use uh, our existing BBC Television Centre as one of our bases. Um, one of the big stories actually for us in 2012 is the use of our new centre in, in the north of England at BBC North, at Media City in Salford. Um, it's a totally digital environment, so it's a solid state digital environment. We, we wouldn't actually be able to do, uh, make the commitment to audiences of content we're delivering in our existing facility at, at Television Centre. It's actually a, a very much a facility built for, a, for an analogue age. And so this uh, digital age, the, again, to come back to the 24 streams in, in, in HD, actually our centre at, at Media C City in, in, in Salford is able to deal with uh, that type of content um, for the first time. So actually, it's us having this base in Salford that enables us to, to make this commitment to, to audiences. So a huge number of our team in Salford will be engaged during ga games time. Our team at the International Broadcast Centre, an operations team at, at Television Centre, um, pretty much everyone in the BBC will be in, engaged in some way in the delivery of 2012. Pra practically all of our organisation, from the torch relay to our international coverage, to the coverage of the, of, of the Olympic sports as well, will we'll be engaged. I mean, simply for the BBC, the biggest thing we will do in our history. Fantastic. Well, I think it represents a unique opportunity for, for all of us um, getting involved in London 2012. So I, I just want to take uh, a minute or two, first of all, to, to thank you all for your, your input today. And judging by the level of questions, it, it's been very useful for the audience as well. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe just get some final thoughts from, from all of you in terms of preparing for what is a very unique opportunity for organisations and individuals going forward. So maybe, Tim, if we could start with you. Uh, to, start, uh, to start with, please. Um, I mean, I think the first thing is uh, plan, prepare. Uh, I mean, we've spent best part of 12 months on, on our programmes trying to make sure that as an organisation we are capable of operating normally and supporting our customers in the way that they expect uh, during games time. I think the second thing is that we, we've got a major uh, sort of task i suppose to make sure that the games actually runs um we will have something like about 800 people actually working on the ground in the games to make sure that the infrastructure functions correctly and that the uh, the actual games goes off without a hitch and i think the final part of it is enjoy it i mean it's a, it's a, it's a hell of an experience it's a once in a lifetime experience and uh, people just need to make sure they make the time to actually appreciate it while it's going on thank you tim and stephen for me, I concur with the third point in particular. For me, it's, it, it's about engagement. It's about fun. It's about making sure that you have thought about how you're going to bring the Olympics and the Olympics experience into the workplace. And I think, uh, like the research showed from Vancouver, companies will realise that they have missed a trick if they don't pull a, every trick out of the hat to make sure people can enjoy it. Thank you. And, and Tim? Yeah, I mean, 2012 is an extraordinary opportunity um, for this country, for, 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 for organisations, for staff in those organisations. Um, you know, those of us uh, and all of us here today have been working on 2012 and we see a glimpse inside just how exciting mm -hmm. it is. Um, and for many people who are getting on with their normal lives, they won't realise until, you know, J June, July, just how big this is, how exciting it is. And we have a really privileged view. Those of us working on 2012 mm -hmm. have an amazing privileged view. And in some ways, I think what we're trying to do over this session is try and just uh, alert people to how much is happening, how big this is going to be, how exciting it is, what an opportunity it is and I suppose we're giving a glimpse from inside the planning um, to those who are thinking about other things to say it's going to be amazing it's going to be extraordinary um, that's our view from inside the 2012 planning uh, and use it to its best ability as a once in a lifetime opportunity. I, I absolutely agree I think this is genuinely one of those unique opportunities that yeah. we won't see again in our lifetime so it's one that we all need to be making sure that we're embracing and, and also encourage uh, people watching to do the same. Yeah. 
So, um, thank you again for, for your contribution today. So it's much appreciated. It really just uh, leads me to, to say a couple of points. So first off, um, if you're looking to get further information on anything that you've heard today, then uh, please go to the cisco.co.uk forward slash London 2012 website. Uh, and there's a wealth of material that will, I think, further extend the conversation that we've just started today. There is also a very active uh, LinkedIn group, which is uh, called Business Ready 2012, and would certainly encourage you to uh, sign up to that and contribute any ideas or, or questions that you may have. Equally, if there's anything that's come out of today that you'd like to follow up with any of us on, then please feel free to, to reach out to us and, and contact us, and we'll do our best to, to answer those questions. But with that, I'd like to, to thank everyone for taking the time to watching, uh, for, for watching this session. And I hope you found it of use and of value and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.